Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today again, uh, especially after our spring snowstorm. Uh, just to get out of the way, as always, if you could please silence your cell phones so we could avoid any interruptions. Uh, my name is Muhammad Muhammad. I'm the executive director here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. And uh, as always, it's a pleasure to welcome you all here today on behalf of our board of directors and our staff. And welcome, of course, to our online audience. Uh, and it's also a great pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Miko Peled, uh, who will be speaking about his latest book called Injustice, the Story of the Holy Land Foundation Five. Um, now, before I get started with a summary, a short synopsis of the book and uh, Miko's bio, uh, just a few words from Steve Fake, who's with uh, Just uh, World Educational and Just World uh, Books. Uh, so he'll be speaking just a little bit. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I represent Just World Books uh, and Just World Educational. Um, we have a number of titles uh, that we've published, including Miko Peled's book, uh, both of his books, actually, um, that are available for sale in the back. Um, I'm also here representing Just World Educational, which is our sister nonprofit, 501c3 organization. Um, we we're very proud to have uh, <clears throat> uh, organized a speaking tour with Miko Pellet um, on this issue of the Holy Land Foundation Five, a case that we think deserves far more attention and speaks to a number of broader issues of civil liberties and political prisoners in the United States. Um, we also have organized a number of uh, other great events um, in the past year and uh, forthcoming in this year. Um, we're bringing the Palestinian cartoonist Mohammed Sabane back to the U.S. for a, another tour um, this fall. And we also have a uh, um, campaign we're calling War Hurts Earth, uh, centered around Earth Day 2018, which is April 22nd. Um, so we're doing events building up to that uh, with the purpose of bringing um, the anti-war movement into the environmental movement, um, uniting those two issues, because war has a huge impact on the environment. Um, so we have a, a lot of great programming, uh, including on Palestine. Um, visit our website, justworldeducational.org. Um, and th again, thank you all for being here. Um, and we turn it back over to Mohammed. Okay, so uh, in July 2004, federal agents raided the homes of five Palestinian American families, uh, arresting the five dads. The first trial of the Holy Land, uh, Holy Land Foundation Five ended in a hung jury. The second, marked by highly questionable procedures, resulted in very lengthy sentences for supporting terrorism by donating to charities that the U.S. government itself and other respected international agencies had long worked with. In 2013, human rights activist and author Miko Pellet started investigating this case. He discussed the uh, miscarriages of justice involved in it with the men's lawyers and heard from the men's families about the devastating effects the case had on their lives. He also traveled to the remote prison comp complexes where the men were held to conduct unprecedentedly deep interviews with them. Injustice traces the labyrinth courses, uh, course of this case uh, presenting in a terrifying picture of governmental overreach in post 9-11 America. Uh, and copies of the book will be available for purchase after the event, and uh, Miko will be available to sign them. So please grab one. Uh, a little bit about Miko Pellet. He is the author of The General's Son and Injustice, and was born in Jerusalem in 1961 into a well-known Zionist family. His maternal grandfather signed the Israeli Decla uh, Declaration of Independence. His father, Mati Peled, fought in the 1948 Israeli War of Independence and was a general in 1967 during the Six-Day War when Israel conquered Gaza, uh, the Jolan Heights, the uh, Sinai, and the West Bank. Later, General Peled became a peace activist and was a leading proponent of an Israeli dialogue with the PLO. Uh, Miko will speak for about 45 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session. Uh, again, we ask that you wait for the mic to come to you before you ask a question so everybody online can hear as well. And for the online audience, you can tweet your questions to at Palestine Center. Uh, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Miko Peled.
Thank you, Muhammad, for uh, the introduction and for inviting me to be here. And thank you all for coming this beautiful afternoon. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I spoke here, last time I spoke here was when the General Sun had just come out about five years ago or so. And it's always nice to come here for events. I like this place a lot. So the, l l as uh, Muhammad was uh, uh, summarizing the book, he basically summarized the book. Um, my interest in the book was as a result of meeting some of the family members of what were known as the Holy Land Foundation Five. I really didn't know about it much, and this was right after my first book had come out and I was speaking in Dallas. And um, some of the daughters of these five were among the student group that invited me to speak. And besides the fact that this story is very confusing and very troubling for obvious reasons, especially when you hear it from, from the family members, so there's a lot of emotion, the more I delved into it, the more I talked to other people around me about the story. Five men ran a charity, were accused of terrorism, received incredibly long prison sentences, So you share this with people around you, and the responses I got were, I found to be very troubling. The responses I got were mainly, well, it's impossible. These things do not happen in the United States. We have a good justice system. We do not have political persecution. These things don't happen. The second uh, response that I got that was very troubling was, well, they must have done something. If they received these long prison sentences, if they were actually convicted in a court of law, then they must have done something. Now, the reason these responses are troubling, well, there are many reasons, but mainly because it demonstrates the lack of um, willingness on the part of Americans to accept, number one, that there is political persecution in America, and there has been for a very long time. Um, all you have to do is talk to black America, members of black America, people who are involved in, 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 uh, in, in the effort for civil liberties and so forth, and find out how many Black Panthers are in jail, still in jail, on trumped up charges. Um, and the th so th they don't know that this took place in America, that an injustice like this is actually part of the American heritage. It's part of American history. Um, and the other thing is that the justice system is not pure, it is not apolitical, it is very politicized, and it's been involved and has participated in the political persecutions here in America for a very long time. I mean, some of us, I'm sure some of you remember, not remember, but have heard of the case of Sacco and Vanzetti from the 19, from 1920s, two Italian immigrants who were framed and executed. So this is something that, that's very troubling that Americans don't know this, and really when I say Americans don't know this, I'm mostly speaking about white privileged America. You know, this is, this is the, these are the, probably the only people in America who would see this story as an erosion of civil liberties. Because for those particular groups within American society, there never have been civil liberties. So it's not really an erosion, it's a reality. Anyway, so that was very troubling to me. And of course, so then I decided, well, I'm going to delve into this some more. And eventually I decided this was going to be a book that I want to write. The question is, how do you put together a book from a story that is so complicated. And the reason it's complicated is because it's got so many different layers. You've got the personal layer, which is the story of five good men and their families and their community. You have another story, which is the ju judicial system and why and how the judicial system was able to you know, pers pursue this. And then you've got the political story, which is Israel-America relations, without which these men would not be in jail. Without which, there's no question, there's no doubt, these men would not be in jail. If they were not Muslim Palestinians, they would not be in jail. Um, and I've been studying this case for five years. I read over 20,000 pages of court transcripts. So it's not just the story, it's not just the, whether it's likely or unlikely, um, but when you read the actual goings on in the courtroom over two trials, lengthy trials with many, many uh, witnesses and documents and so forth, you get a feeling of how things went. And actually, my original intention was to put not all 20,000, but many, many of those 20,000 pages into the book just so people can read and get a feel of what goes on in a courtroom. 
but of course the publisher said no because it would have been a book of you know some thousand pages or more. So we had to we had to cut, and uh, and we only put some of that in. But it's really really important to understand because I didn't want this to be my word against somebody else's word. You have to really read this and to understand. Um, so what is the whole, what was the Holy Land Foundation? The Holy Land Foundation was the largest Muslim charity in America. And like I said, they are they were persecuted and prosecuted because they were Arabs, because they're Palestinians, because they're Muslims, all of the above. Without those three elements, they would not have been in jail. Um, and they were they were providing relief for Palestine primarily, for refugees, orphans, and so forth primarily, but they also provided really a great deal of relief here in the United States after 9-11, after the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, you look at a list of the um, places they went, the things they did throughout the United States, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. They were always there. And the problem was that with, and, and they were apolitical. In other words, they did not serve a certain community because of their race or because of their religion or because of their political beliefs. They served wherever there was a need. And granted, their focus was Palestine, but they were everywhere. And over the years, they developed a fine reputation, really a stellar reputation for being honest, for being on time, for being, doing a good job. They were following very strict guidelines, Muslim guidelines, in terms of how much money that they were getting, how much from their donations was actually being given to charity, which was over, over 90 cents to the dollar, which is incredible was actually going to where it was going to go. Their taxes were filed on time. Every penny that they received was accounted for. You could tell exactly where it came from and where it went. So they did everything right. And because they did everything right, they were creating alliances. They were, they were working with other organizations, both nationally and internationally. And this was exactly the problem. Why was this the problem? Because we have a reality here in the United States, whether we like it or not, where anything that's Palestinian has to be somehow conflated with terrorism. Anything that's Palestinian, be it uh, children's drawing, exhibit of children's drawings from Gaza. Some of you may remember there was an exhibit a few years ago going around. They couldn't find a place to display it. Whether it's a Hassan Kanafani play, you're not going to find a place to show it whether it's a poetry reading. I mean, you name it. Anything that is related to Palestinian, there's always a problem because it's terrorism. Certainly Palestinian resistance, if you talk about Palestinian resistance, whether it's uh, uh, the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, BDS, whether, of course, it's, if it's armed resistance, it's all terrorism. And here there was this area that was somehow untouched. Relief. Charity. This organization was doing great work, and without understanding how serious this was, they were beginning to change the story on Palestine. And I had lengthy conversations with them as well about this. You know, why were they targeted? They were changing the story of Palestine. They were creating a very positive picture of a Palestinian organization run by Palestinians, dedicated to Palestine. Um, and there was concern among pro-Israeli groups here in the United States that this was causing a problem, that this was going to change the narrative. And so in the early to late 1990s, the Anti-Defamation League and others began working on a plan to undermine them, to revoke their not-for-profit uh, status with the IRS, to talk to some of their um, some of the organizations and companies they were aligned with that they were working with. You know, they had they, they had a deal with American Airlines. They had, you know, they were working all over the place, and so they had built alliances. And little by little by little, to just put enough doubt everywhere that these people were actually supporting terrorism. Now in 1995, Hamas, which is the Islamic uh, resistance movement in Palestine, was designated a terrorist organization here in the United States. And so they were saying that they're funneling money to Hamas, which would have been illegal. So that's, that, was, that was the reality in which they were operating. But they always believed that because they did everything right, because they did everything above board, because their paperwork was always done right, because their taxes were always filed on time, and so on and so forth, they had nothing to hide, they had nothing to worry. 
because if you have nothing to hide, that's the assumption, you have nothing to worry about. If you've done nothing wrong and everything is above board, why be concerned? And then 9-11 um, took place. And right after 9-11, obviously, there was a sense of hysteria here in the United States, especially in, you know, here in Washington, D.C. Something had to be done. Somebody had to be arrested. Somebody had to be killed. Something had to do. And so the powers that be, the Treasury Department, Department of State, knew that by December of 2001, which is when the president was going to make a statement, they had to give him something. And the sense was, well, let's round up the usual suspects. And it was December the 4th, 2001, President George Bush stood up and said, Holy Land Foundation has been designated a terrorist organization. They're a major terrorist funding network. Therefore, they will be shut down and their assets were frozen. Well, the president spoke. The president spoke and he must have something. The problem was that there was nothing. There was no proof. So now the government had to work very fast backwards to build a case. Now, when this took place, what's very interesting is this. The Holy Land Foundation, the guys that were actually working within the organization, because not all five were actually involved with the day-to-day with the -day running of the organization, they were not concerned because they said, we did everything right. Obviously, the government's afraid. Obviously, there's a sense of hysteria. This will pass. They hired a good team of lawyers, and they sued the government, which is what you do. The government does something arbitrary. We have the tools. We have the regulations. We have the laws. We can sue the government. So they sued the government. They put together a file with, with evidence that made it absolutely clear they did nothing wrong. The government, on the other hand, had presented what's called the administrative record, which is how the government explains why they did what they did. The administrative record had newspaper articles, a few photocopies of fax documents that came from the government of Israel, no statements under oath, nothing was notarized, nothing was clearly dated, and some statements that were saying, yes, that these guys were supporters of Hamas. The, the, the defense team had a huge body of evidence showing exactly how they did everything right and how this whole claim that they were somehow funding Hamas had absolutely, th there was no foundation to it. And they presented uh, to a court here in Washington, D.C. And then they realized something was going wrong. The judge dismissed the case and struck the evidence from the record. Now, this is problematic in and of itself, but there was one particular item that was particularly troubling. In the government's uh, administrative record, there was a statement that apparently was made by one of Holy Land Foundation's employees in Jerusalem saying that they had actually given money to Hamas. Well, this is problematic. If an employee says it, obviously it's problematic. So when this came up, the defense team contacted this individual's lawyer in Jerusalem to find out what went on. She said, he never said no. He said no such thing. I have all of his statements. I have all of the police record because he was arrested in in Jerusalem as well. The, the, the Israeli government was also uh, clamping down, coming down on them. So all of his statements were sent over here. They had a translation firm translate, notarize, under oath, and he said the exact opposite. He said we had never given money to any political or military organization. The correct translation was in the evidence that was struck from the record. The wrong translation was in the government's file. That was accepted. When they went to appeal, the appellate court said, well, perhaps the judge should not have struck the evidence from the record, but this is not a normal case. We're dealing with national security issues, and therefore, it stood. The, the decision of the lower court stood. Moving forward a little bit, the defense, the lawyers suddenly found out that the government is planning a criminal case. It's planning to investigate, is investigating and planning to indict them on the criminal charges. And they said, well, what could the charge possibly be? They did nothing wrong. All the evidence shows they did nothing wrong. And that's when the government began to change the story. So the new story was not that they were giving money to Hamas, but that they were giving money to organizations that were controlled by Hamas. Now, they were working with organizations that were vetted and approved by the CIA and the State Department. 
they're working with organizations that they were that were that that the um, American Consul General in Jerusalem said were good and and legal and clean organizations. They're working with local charities that the entire world, the United Nations, the Red Cross, et cetera, were working with. So in other words, they were working with organizations that everybody accepted as good and, and honest organizations. There was no evidence that they were governed by any political organization or military organization. So the government brought in two expert witnesses, anonymous, foreign nationals from Israel. One was the member of the Israeli secret police, the Shabak, and one was a member of the Israeli military intelligence. To this day, nobody knows their real name, nobody knows their qualifications, nobody knows their credentials, nobody knows anything about them except that they knew, that they claimed that they knew everything about Hamas. And regardless of what the evidence showed, they said they can smell Hamas. This is in a court of law. This is in a court here in the United States. They can smell Hamas. The government also brought in thousands and thousands of documents that were, that were um, confiscated by raids the Israeli military conducted in offices in the West Bank. Poorly translated, faxed over, photocopied, no sworn statements, nothing under oath, things are not dated. When you look at this stuff, it is beyond belief, beyond belief. The vast majority of the documents were classified. A small portion of the documents were declassified so that the defense team can look at them. It was a kangaroo court that is beyond belief. And by the way, having these two anonymous witnesses was unprecedented. This was the first time in the history of the United States that two anonymous foreign nationals were allowed to testify as expert witnesses. As you heard, the first trial ended with a hung jury. The government changed the story again tweaked the indictments, changed the charges a little bit. They weren't all charged with the same charges. The indictment was different. They, the second judge allowed for evidence and witnesses that the first judge did not allow. And at the end of the second trial, there were all convictions. They came out with all convictions. Now, before I tell you about the convictions and how they came about, it's really important to understand how they came about with this connection between charity and terrorism. It's not something that comes to mind naturally or immediately. I mean, you're, somebody's got to sit in a room and really be creative. How do we take relief work and conflate that with terrorism? So what they said was this. They said, Holy Land Foundation was giving support to orphans in Palestine. They had an orphan support program. Why are these children orphans? because their father is terrorists. And it is well known, well known. This, is, this was said in a courtroom by expert witnesses, by PhDs who sit in think tanks here in Washington, D.C. and advise the president. It is well known that if, we, that, that if somebody knows that their family is going to be supported, then of course they will volunteer to become suicide bombers. I mean, wouldn't we all? It's well known. So it wasn't only support for terrorism, it was encouraging terrorism. Because who wouldn't go and blow themselves up for a few dollars, right? So that their kids could get charity money. This was said in a court of law by experts. And that's why I said earlier, you have to read the transcripts to believe that this kind of nonsense was allowed. So the defense team took the list of the actual orphans that were given support by Holy Land. And they looked at the cause of death of the fathers to find out why did these poor children become orphans. None of the fathers were killed by anything that could possibly be characterized as terrorism. I went the other way. I took a look at the suicide missions that took place when they were taking place in Palestine. And none of the people who participated in these suicide missions had children. That is not the profile. So either way you look at it, those orphans had nothing to do with terrorism. But in a court of law, as one of the lawyers said to me, in the Northern District of Texas, why ruin a good story with the facts? And the only place in the world where those committees, those local charities, were considered to be terrorists, considered to be controlled by Hamas, was in that courtroom in the Northern District of Texas. 
It was beyond, it's beyond belief. Now, I'm going to show you. I visited, I was able to visit, over the years, I was able to visit four of the five Hoyland, uh, called Hoyland Foundation Five. So, Abdurrahman Odi received 15 years. He had nothing to do with the operational side of the organization. He would volunteer, he would go on missions, and many, many people do this. You know, if you're, you go on a mission with a charity organization, you volunteer in another country, you give out food, you give out aid, and so forth. He ran a pantry in, in Patterson, New Jersey, which is where he lived. And from the very beginning of the case, of the investigation, the FBI came up to him and asked him to work with us, to work with them. And he said no. They would come to him at 5 o'clock in the morning, knock on his door. They would stop him on his way to work. They would stop his car in the middle of the road, come out, and uh, try to talk to him. And every time he said no. Eventually, they got angry and they said, you're going to pay for this. You're going to be blacklisted. You're not going to be able to find a job, which was all true, except the part where he was going to be sorry. And he said, you know, Allah provides, you don't provide. I'm not worried. During the trial, he was offered a deal. He'd be out in three, in three years if he was willing to accept the gag order. So he said, well, that means that you will be able to say that I signed a plea agreement. That means I admitted to doing something wrong, which will reflect on the other guys. But because I'll be bound by a gag order, I will not be allowed to say anything. He said, no. They came back to him again and offered him six months. They said, you'd be out in six months. And the other guy said to him, take the deal. At least one of us we know will be free in six months. He said, no. I sat with him in a visitation room in a prison, federal prison. He's wearing overalls, these khaki overalls that prisoners wear. He can't get up to go to the bathroom without permission from the guards. And he's looking at me and he's saying, I'm free. I sleep well at night. I am free. I sleep well at night. 15 years in federal prison. Mohammed al Mzain, um, he was the older of the five. He was kind of the spiritual guy behind the, uh, behind the scenes. He wasn't really involved that much. He would do fundraising and so forth. And he was one of the three that kind of thought up the idea of creating the, uh, this charity organization. Um, I met him in prison right after, I met him several times, but one of the times I met him was right after Donald Trump was elected. And some of you may recall or may know that Ted Cruz wanted to present a bill uh, to add the uh, Muslim Brotherhood to the designated terrorist organization. So in other words, designate the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, which hasn't happened yet. Now this is something that came up. The, the Muslim Brotherhood comes up a lot in the story, and if you get the book, you'll see I talk a lot about the Muslim Brotherhood and about Hamas and about Islam in general, because it's, it's part of the story. It's an important part of the story. And Mohammed al-Mazayn, this, this elderly gentleman, is sitting in front of me, again, in a visitation room in federal prison, wearing these khaki overalls. You know, he's an elderly man. He's well-learned. He knows the Quran by heart. He has an, a degree. I mean, he's a well-learned man, respectable man. Some kid, guard, you know, tells him to come and go like he's some, you know, nothing. And he's sitting in front of me, looking right at me. And regardless of how we feel or what we think about the Muslim Brotherhood, he's looking straight at me and he says, I am a Muslim brother. And they will never change me. They can't change me. We're sitting in a visitation room in the prison. Cameras and microphones everywhere. You know, again, he's a free man. He said, this is who I am. This is what I believe. Again, putting aside for a second all the, the hysteria, the propaganda against the Muslim Brotherhood going on in America right now, but this is, a, this is one of, probably one of the finest men you'll ever meet, and he's sitting there in front of me, looking straight at me, the guards everywhere. Again, he can't get up to go to the bathroom. And he says to me, they'll never change me. Third was Mufid Abdul Qadir. Again, had nothing to do, nothing to do, with the Hurland Foundation as an organization. He was a volunteer, he would sing, he would uh, do fundraisers, you know, things that people in the community do during events. Why was he brought in? For one reason alone. His brother was Khaled Mash'al. Khaled Mash'al 
was the political head of Hamas for many, many years, until very recently, actually. He was really the political face of Hamas. The two hadn't seen each other in decades. And it was very interesting because at the beginning of the trial, the prosecutors were saying, well, you know, we can't really, we can't really um, blame him for something, blame somebody for what a family member does. At the same time, they kept showing how family connections are incredibly important, especially when you're talking about crime and terrorism. So they tried to play both ways. At the end of the first trial, he was found not guilty on all charges. 32 charges, the judge read out, not guilty, 32 times. When the prosecution began to poll the, witness, the, to poll the uh, jurors, one of the jurors stood up and said, wait a minute, no, 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 I changed my mind. I made a mistake. So regardless of the fact that the foreman showed that they all signed, the defense team stood up and objected. The judge said, mistrial on him as well. He's now serving 20 years. 20 years in federal prison. His wife just had a stroke. You know, God help her. Unbelievable stories. The CEO and really the heart and soul of the organization was Shukri Abu Bakr. And I, dedicate the, I dedicated the book to his daughter, Senabil. And um, the prosecution did something very interesting. They said, well, the Holy Land Foundation was established in 1987, and Hamas was also established in 1987. Therefore, there's an obvious connection. They left out two pieces of information. The first Palestinian uprising, the Intifada, began in 1987 which caused a, an enormous need for relief in Palestine. Closures, arrests, killing of civilians. There was a huge need. I mean, there was a need before that too, but there was an enormous need that arose as a result of that. Another thing that happened is Shukri's daughter, Sanabil, was born in 1987. She was born with several life-threatening diseases. And so they availed themselves of charity hospitals here in the United States. And that was the first time Shukri was really you know, uh, became aware of this, of this world of charitable, charitable giving and, and uh, relief work and so forth and decided he wants to dedicate his life to make that sort of service available to Palestinians. And that was the drive. She was the drive. Um, and they had a very, very special relationship. And that was the drive for him to get involved in that kind of work. Um, 65 years in federal prison. And the last one, which I was not able to meet for reasons that I cannot explain and whatever explained to me, was Hassan Elashi. He was a non-paid president of the organization, uh, also one of the founders of, of, uh, of the Holy Land Foundation. An unbelievable story. If I was to say that these are the five the finest men I've ever met, that would be an understatement. That would be an understatement. There's no doubt in my mind, not a shred of a doubt, that these men are not only innocent, but the finest men that we will ever meet. And so the second trial ended with all convictions. These were the, this is how, this is, these were the prisons, these were the sentences they received. And um, the appellate court, when they went to appeal, said that actually in the, the judge in the second trial should not have allowed some of the pieces of evidence that were allowed and were not allowed in the first trial. However, they said it was harmless. So the defense team came back and said, what do you mean harmless? The first one came out with no convictions. The second one came out with all convictions, and this was the difference. But that was the end of the story. Supreme Court wouldn't hear the case. There was a campaign uh, to petition President Obama to commute their sentences and deport them. And there were several countries who were willing to accept them and give them citizenship. President Obama wouldn't do it. And so their legal options have been really exhausted. Now, here's what I believe to be true. Like I said earlier, these men would not be in jail if they were not Palestinians, if they were not, if they were not Muslims. They would not be in jail. This would not have been an issue. And of all the different layers of the story, I think the one that is probably the least understood in America, and the one to which not, not, there's not enough attention to any of this, but really the one layer to which very little attention is given, is the Israel-American relationship and what is happening in Palestine. You have to really struggle to get good information about what is happening in Palestine. I see people, I go to Palestine all the time. 
And people say to me, so it seems like things are kind of quiet and things are pretty good in Palestine right now, aren't they? I mean, we don't hear anything. And you, you don't know what to say. I mean, you want to pull your hairs out. <laughs> things are good in Palestine? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to veer a little bit and talk a little bit about what is happening in Palestine. And I think that explains why this case is so severe. In other words, the severity of the sentences, the insistence that these people go to jail, the insistence that Hoyland must be brought down is because they were changing the story and that is a very dangerous thing. The minute people in America really get a grasp of what is happening in Palestine. And you know, Americans were all complicit because it's our taxpayers' money and we give Israel more money than anybody else. So unless we're standing up and resisting, we're complicit in it. Unless we think it's good and maybe then it's not complicity. Um, so I think it's incredibly important. So I'm going to go through that um, real quickly. You know, when people talk about this country, they always use two names. Israel, Palestine, Palestine, Israel. Has anybody here visited Palestine, Israel? Anybody been there? Anybody from there? A couple of people. So there's the, it's almost like there's this schizophrenia. It's Israel, it's Palestine. It's Palestine, it's Israel. It's uh, Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories. It's the occupied Palestinian territories and Israel proper. It's disputed. It's not disputed. No, it's an occupation. No, it's not an occupation. Well, how could it be, how could such a small place have so many names and so many different descriptions? And I think this is because some people are afraid and some people are just not willing to speak about it with clarity. Not willing to speak about it with clarity because we're, you know, for all kinds of reasons. So the history helps us. Israel was established in 1948. After its forces, they were not called Israeli forces yet, but you know, Zionist forces conquered 78, almost 80% of the land. They conquered it and they named it Israel. Five minutes before that, it was all Palestine. Five minutes before that, it was all Palestine. Once the Zionist forces conquered that part of Palestine, the vast majority of the country, they named it Israel and that was it. It became Israel. And there were two parts that were left out that made up the 22%, which Israel 20 years later decided to take in 1967. They're called the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. I don't have them on the map because they don't really have any significance. There is no West Bank geographically. There is no Gaza Strip geographically. Somebody stood there with a piece of paper and drew a line and said, well, we're going to make the border here and there. And then when we're ready, we'll take that as well. And that's exactly what they did. 20 years later, they took it. So in 67, it wasn't the beginning of an occupation. It was the completion of a process that began in 1948, which was all occupation. So then, if people say occupy Palestinian territories, does that mean that there are some Palestinian territories that are not occupied somewhere? Because where are they? When people say Israel proper, why is one part of Israel proper and another one is not proper? Because it's all the same. All of Israel is built on occupied Palestinian land. All Israeli towns and cities are settlements that were built on Palestinian land. All Israeli agriculture uses Palestinian water. So how is one part proper and one part not? We either accept it or reject it. We either accept the fact that a foreign power takes the land, changes the name, and makes it its own, or reject it. But why we accept one and kind of reject or are ambivalent about the other? It makes no sense. And then, you know, over the last 50 years, people have been talking about this idea that somehow there will be a two states. Israel will maintain the majority of Palestine, and the Palestinians will get that little 22%. But what has Israel done since it took that 22%? built for Jews, destroyed Palestinian land, and kicked out Palestinians. So really, 1967 was the finalization of the conquest, the finalization of the establishment of a single state for Jewish people in Palestine. So we need to be clear about that. Whether we agree to it or not, I think we owe ourselves and we owe the world clarity. And basically, we have two choices. We either accept it as Israel, in which case Palestine is crossed off the map, in which case we legitimize what had happened over the last seven decades, the occupation and so forth, the ethnic cleansing, the regime of apartheid, and the crossing out of Palestine, or we reject it, and then we must call it Palestine. It's really not to, nothing to do with politics, it's more really our value system. Now, I said some big words, so I want to clarify. 
when we say ethnic, or when I say ethnic cleansing, people come up and say, how could you possibly say ethnic cleansing? Jews would commit ethnic cleansing? Well, there's a definition of ethnic cleansing. International law has defined ethnic cleansing. In 1948, Israel pushed out close to a million Palestinians and destroyed their land and took it over. From 1967 till today, the additional 22%, they did the exact same thing. So it's, that's called ethnic cleansing. Maybe we agree to it, maybe we don't, but it is ethnic cleansing. I use the word apartheid. People say, ha, I think Nancy Pelosi one time said, it is unconscionable to think that Jews would ever allow apartheid. Well, when you have systemic legal system where one group has one set of laws and the other one has a different set of laws, that's apartheid. It's defined in international law. Now compare this to what Israel does. It's very simple. Arbitrary arrest, illegal imprisonment, that happens all the time. Living conditions calculated to cause uh, physical destruction and, of course, denying members of a certain racial group basic human rights. This is the reality. I have an Israeli citizenship, a Palestinian with the same citizenship, even if he has an Israeli citizenship, has, lives under completely different laws, different reality. And the biggest word of them all is genocide. How can anybody suggest that Jews would ever commit genocide? Well, first of all, Jews are not any different than other people. They're not any better or not any worse. And the Geneva Convention defined the crime of genocide. All we have to do is compare the crime of genocide to what Israel is doing, and somebody tell me that it's not genocide. And the thing is with the Geneva Convention, in order to call it a crime of genocide, you have to show intent. Well, if you drop a bomb and you kill 20 civilians once, that's obviously not intent to commit genocide. If for seven decades, you drop bombs and kill and destroy on a regular basis, now that's pretty clear that there's intent, knowing full well that you're killing civilians. And then there's also the complicity in genocide, which is also a crime. And I very strongly believe that the US government has been involved in, is complicit of that crime for a very long time in Palestine. You know, Gaza is probably the perfect example. Two million people living the, uh, without clean water. If you want to kill someone, other than shooting them, you deny them water. Healthcare. A child in Gaza with a curable cancer will die. A Jewish Israeli child five minutes away on the other side of the wall will live with the exact same disease. Why? Because Israel decides who gets access to healthcare. And Israel decided that two million people in Gaza will not have that access. And of course, there wouldn't be a Gaza Strip, there wouldn't be all these poor refugees in Gaza had it not been for the ethnic cleansing campaign of 1940, that began in 1948. And this is what Gaza looks like after bombing. I took some of these pictures. This hasn't changed in years because they're not allowed to build. And why is Israel bombing Gaza on a regular basis? Well, what are you going to do? You've got this humanitarian catastrophe right at your doorstep, 30 minutes from Tel Aviv where everybody's living like this where you wouldn't dream of not having clean water or electricity. So what do you do? You either let, the, let everybody go home, rebuild, make peace, or, and this is another piece of ingenuity, you kill them and blame them for being terrorists. And that seemed to work. For years, Israel has been bombing Gaza, blaming, it, blaming them for being a threat, even though there's never been a military force in Gaza. And there you go. Everything's fine. Two million people. So this is severe. This is, uh, has anybody here been to Jerusalem? Outside the old city of Jerusalem, there's a community called Silwan. It's 50,000 families. It's right down the hill from the old city, Wadi Hilwe. And someone decided that under these homes is the true city of David. Now, both Jewish and Christian archaeologists, Zionists, have been digging the country for 200 years trying to prove there was a King David. They still haven't found any proof. But somebody said they'll find the proof under these homes. So this is what's being done. So homes are collapsing because of the digging. Homes next door are beginning to collapse. And when people leave, Jewish settlers come in and take the homes. Every Jewish settler has a home has a guard. They have their own militia, which is armed and accountable to no one. And this is also that they could build the City of David archaeological site. And they have tour guides, tour buses there, 
walking in completely oblivious to the process that's taking place in broad daylight, which is complete ethnic cleansing. Home demolitions in Jerusalem. This is all over Jerusalem. Piles and piles and piles of beautiful homes. And why does this happen? Because they had no permit. They had no permit to build, and therefore they're destroyed. Well, I know many Israeli Jews that build without a permit. They build a balcony. They build another story. They apply later. They apply, and then they start building before the permit comes. They pay a fine. They go to court. It takes years. You never see this. You never see the army cordon off the street and bulldozers destroying an Israeli Jewish home. Never. Because of a permit. And then entire communities turned into ghost towns. This is all around Jerusalem. Birnabala, Kalandia, Aram. These are communities, thriving communities all around Jerusalem. Ghost towns. Ghost towns. Ghost towns. Brand new. Some of these buildings are new. Ghost towns, apartments, businesses, ghost town. Total ethnic cleansing. Absolute ethnic cleansing. Hebron, if you've been to Hebron, you just go drive down to Hebron, in one of the intersections, that's your intersection, they've got snipers on the main road looking through the site with their finger on the, on the trigger as you drive by. And they're not looking for somebody who looks like me. I drive there all the time. And this is Hebron, Shuhada Street. It's been closed since 1994. It was the main thoroughfare in Hebron, in the old city of Hebron. Hundreds and hundreds of stores, thousands and thousands of residents. Only settlers are allowed in the military on that street. And there's a campaign that just ended, actually, an international campaign, which is run by Youth Against Settlements in Hebron. It's called Open Shuhada Street, to raise awareness to this reality in Hebron. It's beyond belief. So there's a lot that they're trying to hide. This is why they can't have the Holy Land Foundation suddenly, through charity work, revealing all of this and legitimizing their work as Palestinians. We really can't have that. I'm sure you've heard of Ahit Tamimi, the Palestinian girl who was arrested. But you know, Israel arrests, detains between five and 700 children every year. And in the three weeks after Trump's Jerusalem declaration, they arrested close to 100 just in those three weeks. And again, if you want to get rid of people, harass their children. That's all we need as parents. If we know our kids are going to be treated like this, who's going to stay? This picture is Hebron. This is not, all, all these pictures are new. Nothing here is old. I'm sure, like I said, you've heard of Ahitamimi, the Palestinian girl. Her father happens to be one of my best friends. This is at their home just a few months ago. And as a child, she was invited to um, Turkey, and she met with President Erdogan, who gave her them a great honor because they're, you know, a, f a family of fighters. Not literal fighters, but, you know, resistance. And in this little girl, she was very young then, she looked up at President Erdogan and said, why is it that if we have an Israeli passport, you, get a, you don't have to pay to come to Turkey? If you have a Palestinian passport, you have to pay to get a visa. And you claim that you support Palestine from the miles of babes. And this is her now in court. She, they just signed a deal. She's going to be in prison for eight months. I know. He's, you know. No, I don't. I'm sorry? Well, she was arrested. She was arrested uh, four months ago. Um, her, their home is being constantly invaded by soldiers. And she was videotaped pushing a bunch of soldiers out of her house and then slapping one of the officers. And Israeli society went nuts. And the Israeli government went nuts. So they came back at 2 o'clock in the morning, arrested her and her mother. And they've been in jail without a trial since then. And I was there a few weeks ago during one of the hearings before the trial. And the judge said to her specifically, because why, why does she have to be in jail until the trial? She didn't shoot anyone. She pushed the... She did what I have a daughter, and what I would hope she would do the same if, if men come into her room and into her house, that she would have the courage to push them out and then slap them, which is exactly what they deserved. And these were armed men. So the judge, so why is she in jail? The judge said to her, because she maintains her right to remain silent during the interrogations, she's a danger and she will remain in jail until the trial. And the trial only actually officially began a couple of weeks ago. So because she maintains her right to remain silent, that is why she had to be in jail, she and her mother. And now they just signed a deal, um, so she'll be in jail for probably f five, six more months. But it's beyond. 
And this is exactly after they shot her cousin. I mean, this family has lost do I mean, dozens of, you know, more than 20 people were killed in that family, just in their family, you know, by, by the mili by Israeli military. And here's one girl who dares to stand up. So I don't know where the Me Too movement is and where Susan Sarandon is, but I don't hear their voices talking about her. And she is ex did exactly what every young lady should do in this, in this position. But now she's in jail. You know, that's the reality. Um, and I'm sure you know, but if you didn't, you should, that there is a new bill, H.R. 4391, the McCullum bill, which deals exactly with this issue. Now, you know, here's the thing. Everybody likes to express solidarity. We've come to a point where solidarity with Palestine is not enough. Okay, the patients on the ground bleeding to death, standing there and cheering on is not going to do them any good. The patients dying very rapidly. That's Palestine. We must, we must, we must act. And I think this bill is very good because for the first time, it actually talks about Palestinian rights unconditionally. It actually mentions Palestine and the, and, and, and the oppression of Palestinians and the mistreatment of Palestinian children by Israel here in the, in the House of Representatives. So I don't know if you're in D.C., of course, we're all, you know, we don't have a voice. But if you don't live in D.C. and you have a, Congress, uh, a member of Congress, then you should make sure that your member of Congress supports, uh, supports this bill, you know. And it requires, at the end of the day, that the Secretary of State make sure that American funds are not going to the facilities and to the processes in which children are being abused. And the abuse is beyond belief. It's horrifying. They get dragged at 2 o'clock in the morning. They're beaten. They're arrested. They're interrogated for hours. They're transferred from jail to jail. They're held and treated like adults, like terrorists, not like minors. Anyway, so this is a serious, so this is a good, this is a good first step here in the United States. And so, again, I would urge everybody to take action by making sure that members of Congress actually support this bill. And then, you know, the, probably the three most feared words in Israel today and in a way, very much feared here in Washington, D.C., boycott, divestment, and sanctions, or BDS. You know, Chuck Schumer said this was a new form of anti-Semitism, calling for justice, for freedom, and for equality. And my question is, where is the anti-Semitism? So somehow, equality, justice, and freedom do not stand well with Jewish values? Is that what he's saying? Because when we look at the demands of the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, a call that came, by the way, from Palestinian civil society. All we see is a call for ending the occupation, military occupation, which we all know everybody says needs to end, full equality for Palestinians, and the right of return of Palestinians to their home and their land. Where is the injustice? Where is the anti-Semitism? Somebody stand out and point to me where the anti-Semitism anti is, because I don't see it. It doesn't even talk about the Jews doesn't mention Jews, doesn't talk about kicking anybody out, deporting anyone. It's completely remedial and reasonable. So if we are serious about supporting justice in Palestine, rather than looking at the patient who's bleeding to death and cheering them on, boycott, divestment, and sanctions is something we should all get involved in. Every single person has got to make sure that the store we go to, whether it's Costco, whether it's Trader Joe's, whether it's a local grocery, do not, do not, do not carry Israeli products. If you want to go get more serious, start a letter writing campaign. Talk to your neighbors. Go to the BDS uh, website and look at their campaigns. There's a big campaign against HP now. You know, there's a lot of things that can be done, but we're not working fast enough, and I swear to you, I go to Palestine all the time, the patient is bleeding to death very rapidly. It has never been this bad. It has never been this severe. My entire life, I've, you know, Palestine has been, has been part of my life, and it's never been this bad. And at the end of the day, you know, we really only have two options, and these options have nothing to do with politics. They have everything to do with our value system, like I, said, is, like I said earlier. We either recognize and accept and legitimize the state of Israel, which means genocide, ethnic cleansing, and apartheid. It means violence, racism, and the lies that go on and on and on to justify them. Or we fight and we resist 
for a free Palestine with a, de with a real democracy, with equal rights, with the right of refugees to return, respect for children's rights, and so on and so on, everything that comes with that. It's a, it's a question of values. that has got nothing to do with you being a Republican or a Democrat or a Green or anything else. Where do our values lie? With racism or against racism? With violence or against violence? With the truth or with the mythology? And I'm going to leave you with these pictures. Uh, this is a picture that I took in a refugee camp, not far from, pa not in Palestine, but not far from Palestine. And I can promise you that any one of us, if we had to live in this refugee camp, in these appalling conditions, we would not be smiling. We would not be smiling. We would not have these cheerful smiles. It is beyond belief, the appalling conditions. And the only reason they live in these conditions is because Israel has banned them from returning. They're probably no more than an hour, an hour and a half drive from the homes from which their parents or grandparents were kicked out. So if you want to see these children back in their homes, not living in squalor, which there's no, for which there's, there's no reason in the world they should live this way, if you want to see Abdurrahman and Mufid and Muhammad al mizain and Ghassan al Ashi and Shukri Bakir, if we want to see all of that, then we need to act. And we need to embrace this idea of what a free Palestine means. And a free Palestine is the only reality in which this can happen. The only reality in which the persecution of people, good men like these will stop. The only reality in which these children and millions like them in Palestine and around Palestine can live like normal human beings. You know, we're talking about Palestine. There's plenty of water. There's plenty of technology. There's plenty of electricity. There's no reason to live in squalor. The only reality in which this can happen is a free Palestine, a free democratic Palestine with equal rights, with the right of return, respecting the rights of all human beings as human beings. And it's all up to us. It can happen next year. It can happen never. It's all up to us. Thank you all very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Ibrahim. Um, I just want to say I, I come from a family that, um, you know, we're talking about the primary victims of, of the Holy Land Foundation Five, but um, just to expand your, your imagination a little bit, or reality, I should say, is any organization that was of Muslim background, of Arab background, of uh, Palestinian background, of any way, shape, or form that had any connection to these five individuals, the organizations they worked for, uh, any organization they had charity in, uh, that worked, worked in charity with, um, had many problems for their lives. I, I come from a family that has had several problems as a result of just knowing uh, the work of that organization through other organizations within the uh, activist community. Um, so I re the reason why I say this is there's a, mass there's a massive chill effect on Palestinian Americans in the United States that most people that are coming from non-Palestinian um, or, or non-Arab or non-Muslim backgrounds, don't really realize. And it's important to realize this because there are a lot of their organizations out there that are still chilled by this effect till this day. Many people might ask this question of what, how, how, to, how, uh, how to help them or how to reach out to them. Uh, it's simply reaching out to them. You know, there's, we had a, a less this past weekend, I'm sure Michael knows about it, we had a Palestine Advocacy Day uh, on the Hill. It was about 80% Palestinian Americans. Uh, there's not many, like the, the complete opposite make a demographic of this group probably um, in terms of percentage makeup. And I don't say this as a critical, and from a critical perspective, I'm just saying this, that there are people on both sides of this specific side of human rights that don't connect with each other because of this chill effect. And it's really important to realize that, to think about it at all times, because when pa what the reason why m the rest of the Palestinian Americans out there in the United States are not as active, the main reason is this major chill effect, indirectly from this massive uh, fear effect that started from 9-11 from the Bush administration onwards, and before that, of course, in minor ways leading up to that major moment. So I just wanted to add that little comment. And that is one of the successes of the, of the process. Yeah. Miko, thanks again. I wanted to touch in. This hits home for me because I'm from Dallas. Uh, and I grew up with some of their children. Uh, 
Sinabin was in my class, like I told you earlier. Um, and so I went to some of those, to those trials, and you, you mentioned, you kind of answered the first part of my question, uh, which was about the, uh, the Shin Bet agents that testified. So when we were there and then they brought, it was a him, uh, they made us all leave the courtroom and they took us upstairs so we could just hear him but we couldn't see him or like you said they didn't say his name so my question was if that happens often here uh, and you said it's unprecedented yeah uh, I don't know if it's happened again since then but uh, but the second part is why does Israel get this kind of special treatment whereas others don't well that's the four billion dollars a year question <laughs> Um, the, this, this, this relationship between, uh, this relationship between Israel and the United States has a lot to do, with Ibrahim? With what Ibrahim just told us. Um, th I'm sure you all are aware that there's a very powerful, very influential lobby called APAC. They just had their conference. Now, here's what's interesting. When people think of a lobby, I used to think that way too. I think of, you know, guys in suits, you know, sitting around the members of Congress offices and lobbying and talking, which is true. That is what happens. That happens all the time. But we have to understand that the Israeli, the Zionist lobby began before the state of Israel was established. It began at the turn of the previous century. You know, my grandfather was part of a team of young, secular, intellectual, highly educated uh, Zionist Jews who traveled around the world to promote this idea of Zionism, of the return of the Jews to the land of Israel. And it appealed to many people, many white European Christians. It appealed to them. It appealed to them. Um, and they began their work influencing politicians, influencing newspaper editors and publishers, n influencing the movie makers, influencing education system, influencing, because they seemed so reasonable and so well-educated. And they didn't look Jewish. They shaved their beards and they looked so much like us, so white and civilized. They were able to influence thinking, you know, public thinking and pub, you know, public opinion on this issue because they've been at it for a long time and they're incredibly good at it. They are incredibly good at it. Last week or two weeks ago when they had their conference, there was a march. I, you know, every, every year we have a march to oppose APAC. And they come out in their nice suits and, you know, and they're all so clean and so educated and they try to engage with everyone and they try to talk and the stuff that comes out of their mouth, they would make you think that the world is flat. <laughs> they are very, very good at it. Very good at it. And so that is why, that is why they are able to make this happen. That is why they get $4 billion a year and that's just a foreign aid. Forget all the money that goes from not-for-profit, tax-exempt organizations that go directly to settlements, exactly directly to the Israeli army and so forth. Billions and billions of dollars. You know, this is why this happens. This is why the, Israel, the, the, the American military and the Israeli military just completed a, uh, a joint exercise called Juniper Cobra. The two with, with air, air defenses and, and helicopters in, in, you know, over there in the Middle East together, working together. That's why all this is happening, you know? And that's why you can have every major member of Congress, um, the vice president, governors, pastors, God knows who, at the APAC conference. A, a, a US senator can stand up, publicly say, that because the Arabs do not believe in the Torah, there, cannot, there will not be peace. I mean, the stuff that comes out of these people's mouth, if it was any other conference, if it was any other group of people, that would not, not, he would not have get away with it. So this is why, this is why they're very good at this, and this is why it's a tough battle for us. And I met, a few, last year I was at a dinner, and there were two former members of Congress, one Republican, one Democrat, and they both were members of Congress for a very long time, retired. And they suddenly discovered Palestine. They went on a church trip, and they suddenly came back, and they said, oh my God, you, can you believe what is happening there? And I said, you've been, you've been voting for this, for this foreign aid bill every single year. Enormous amounts of money, and you didn't know? And what they said was, you know, really an eye-opener. They said, look, the other guys, the Israelis, the pro-Israelis, they're in our offices all the time. We don't see the other guys. They don't show up. They don't come to our offices. They don't talk to us. That's not an excuse, but it's revealing because it's true. In other words, they should know better. But the fact is that it's hard to compete. 
You do try, and they don't pick up the phone. I know that. I know. Uh, I have a question, but first let me say that Jewish Voice for Peace, of which I'm a member, is now lobbying the D.C. Uh, Council to stop the uh, uh, joint training of the D.C. police with, with right. Israelis. Right. Anyway, but my question is, and I ask this question uh, every time I come here, and I'm afraid I get the, answer, the same answer all the time, but I'll ask you anyway. Is there any hope for change within Israel itself? Okay, people ask me that all the time, too. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll say, I'll, let me just, before I answer your question, JVP, by the way, Jewish Voice for Peace is, is on a list of 20 organizations of whom the members are now banned from entering the country by the government of Israel. So you've got JVP, which is ridiculous because it's a Jewish organization, but even worse than that, the American Friends Service Committee, where the Quakers are banned the American Friends Service Committee, it's a Quaker organization, and they are now on a list of banned uh, organization, you know, organizations whose members are banned from entering the country by the state of Israel. You know, Quakers were saving Jews in the Holocaust. I mean, the Quakers are angels, right? I mean, they, they do all, nothing but good in the world. Um, and that's the reality. That's how Israel is. And um, JVP was about to sponsor a speaking tour for Yusuf Jabarin, who is a Palestinian member of the Israeli Knesset fine man. He's got a law degree from Georgetown. He could have been doing other things and making a lot of money. He's sitting in the Knesset as a Palestinian member, of, member, which is not a pleasant job, I can promise you, but it's important work. So, and I know him personally, he was invited to give a speaking tour by JVP, and the Knesset is forbidding him from going. The Knesset, the Israeli House of Representatives, is forbidding him from going because it's sponsored by JVP, which is an organization that is banned. And why are they banned? because they've adopted the call for BDS, Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. That's the common denominator between all of these. So that's the reality. Now, your question is a difficult one. It's not a difficult one. The answer is a difficult one, particularly for Jewish people. Um, and I've gone through the pain, so now I can talk about it with some ease. Israel is an inherently, deeply racist society. It is. It's an inherently, deeply racist state. My sister, who's an educator, wrote a book about the Israeli education system called Palestine and Israeli School Books. Check it out. As an academic, it's not political, it's academic, demonstrating precisely how the Israeli education system prepares young racists to go to the army and kill Palestinians. It is heart, it, it breaks your heart. And you know, Israel looks like a nice, liberal, sweet, fun place, right? It's beyond belief what happens as soon as they put on a uniform and go across the checkpoint. So I don't think that there is any reason to expect change from within Israel. Now, some people, some of us are old enough to remember where there used to be this Israeli left, this Israeli peace movement. Problem with that is you can't be Zionist and left. You can't be Zionist and support peace. Zionism is apartheid. Zionism is racism. So you can either be a racist or you can be on the left and support peace and equality and human rights. You can't do both. And when it push came to shove, that entire movement opted to remain Zionist with a few individuals that actually are still, you know, still at it or still fighting for justice for, Palestin for, you know, for Palestinians. But the vast majority have opted for Zionism. And that's a value. It's values. It's not going to do with politics or anything like that. It's who you are. And that's why it doesn't exist. So I don't think there's any hope f that will come from within. Just like I don't think that it was realistic to expect that white South Africans would embrace the end of apartheid. You know, privileged groups, we don't tend to embrace change. We, we like to keep our privilege. Um, but I think the day after, the day after the regime collapses, the day after there are one person, one vote elections, and there's a legislature and a government that represents all the people, people are going to wake up in the morning, and they're going to send their kids to school, and they're going to go to work, and they might have a Palestinian prime minister, and then the kids are going to have a Palestinian teacher, and the sky is not going to fall, and then people are going to realize, well, actually, you know what? We can live like this. But I think the process of bringing them to their knees first and having the entire thing collapse is, is inevitable if we want to reach that, you know, the other side. The mic's right behind you. Um, I was just wondering, if when the last time that I was in... Um, Israel in February, I noticed that when I was talking to Israelis, they are absolutely scared to death of Palestinians. 
So the city of Nazareth, very nice place. You can walk at night, no problems. And then Nazareth Elite, Nazareth Elite is right above that, and I talked to the people there, and it, it's very close, it's walking distance. And uh, I asked them if they'd ever been to the churches or if they'd ever been down there, and the young Israelis that I was talking to, a, a mother and daughter actually, said, oh no, no, it's dangerous there, it's very dangerous there, we're not allowed there, the, the churches don't allow us in there, and so they have these ideas. So do you think at all that, you know, that these walls that, that are going up and the Israeli open roads and everything are going up, um, it's a double-edged sword in the sense that they really don't want uh, Israelis to actually meet Palestinians or talk to people and find out that, hey, you know what, these are actually human beings, these are actually nice people, that it's, it's better. The way that you can keep up the lie that these are dangerous, you know, animals that we need to keep contained. The boogie monster lives in Nazareth. Uh, you know, do you think that the walls are, are partially to do that as well? Well, I think that all the walls are only in order to do that. That's the only reason they put up the wall. There is no security argument for the walls. Now, I grew up in Jerusalem. There was no wall. There were no checkpoints when I was growing up. We never would go to a Palestinian neighborhood. From time to time, we'd go into the old city because it was certain parts of the old city of Jerusalem were kind of safe. But even then, you know, our mothers would be worried. But... Um, I grew up in Jerusalem. You never went to, and there was no wall, but the wall was up here. Yeah. To go to Nazareth with all the Arabs? Umar Faham with all the Arabs? And these are Israeli citizens. Are you out of your mind with all the billboards in Arabic and everybody's an Arab? It's dangerous. They want to kill us. So we didn't even need the actual physical wall. The actual physical wall is, has other reasons. Of course, none of it has anything to do with security. It all has to do with segregation and fear. Uh, but absolutely, they, no, the, 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 they want to maintain the fear because that's how they maintain the oppression. That's the excuse. I almost forgot what I was about to say, but I, I just want to reemphasize that you know, everything that was said today is, is, a, is a so, sort of something that's never been talked about. Uh, never, never does get talked about in American media. Uh, you know, the disgusting nature of, of the court system uh, uh, for these five individuals that we talked about today, the Holy Man Foundation Five. I mean, they're almost finishing with the, up their sentences. Is it 15, 15, 20? Well, it's, they started in 2009, so the 15 year ones are beginning to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. So, what do we do after they're out? Is there, do we have a plan? Like, there's so many things that Muslim American organizations cannot do, they cannot help hold up a figure of the stature of an unknown Nelson Mandela in, is, in, in, in American prisons here. What do we do after they're out? They're, I mean, we have, we have leaders in prisons, whether that be from Black Panther movement or, or, or from the Palestinian uh, uh, charity movement in the US. How are we going to stop this type of thing from reoccurring for all sorts of communities? There are Latinos out there, Latino organizers out there also in prison serving sentences that are very long. Also for ridiculous uh, situations like this. We need to be able to cross this, this color divide that we have in activism where our organizations will stand up with each other on principle, but the memberships are not intermixing. There's no conversations happening on the ground. I mean, how, how, it's a pretty dire situation for these communities. And we can't just keep being in these, in these bubbles of organizations, nonprofit organizations that don't eventually coordinate because of their own, own problems within, whether they be technical problems or whatever they may be, capability problems. Us as individuals here sitting down who have the freedom to move without boundaries of a contract, whether that be with a job or a nonprofit, need to be able to cross over into these organizations that are doing specific work. We have legislation 4291 right now for the, McC the Betty McCollum bill, we need to get that passed. How obvious is it that you know, children need to have the basic rights that we have in the United States through our aid to Israel? I mean, it's, it's a pretty, we don't even need a bill. Technically speaking, we do not need a bill to protect children uh, 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 it, that are halfway around the world that are being discriminated against and treated badly because of by using American money. We don't, American money is supposed to only be lawfully given to other people based on American law. So the point is, is over here, you, we, need, we need further emphasis here between us. 
to take it beyond the lecture. Really take it beyond the lecture. There are organizations out there that Michael can tell you about, I can tell you about, people that are in the activist Palestine, the Palestine activist scene in the United States can tell you about that need hands-on help with specific campaigns that they're running on a year basis. They're probably only running one or two campaigns the entire year. One, two hands that are sincere, that are dedicated to fulfilling the tasks on a daily basis will help a lot. Each of you guys can help a lot. I mean, these major events that you're looking at, this event by itself, probably one person set it up. The a Advocacy Day this past weekend that I was telling you guys about, that we had 235 uh, people show up at the Hill and knock on 70 doors for congressmen and women senators, That's, that took two people dedicated for really dedicated for three weeks. There's, these things are major influencers on the change that can happen in the United States. You just need to be able to commit to it, just a tiny bit. Treat it like a part-time job, 10 hours a week. I'm, let's be practical, I'm trying to get down to the business here. Let's get moving on these bills. Let's start moving change. APAC cannot say no to a children's bill in the United States. You know how embarrassing that is politically? To say that you do not support a bill that protects Palestinian children from abuse, that's basic principle. J Street, all these people that have these major influences on the Israel lobby can immediately be tackled at their core because their core principles are at risk by a small bill that protects Palestinian children's rights. So we need to be able to believe in the small things so that the big things can happen at the end. That change on the ground the next day where everybody has a right to vote, these things, these simple, these simple uh, concepts that are, uh, you know, should be universal, that we have as a guarantee of the United States, can be immediately implemented if we believe in the small things that expose the bigger picture. And the ending to this presentation was very clear as to why that is. Because there is a real harsh problem that we have in, in, the, in the, US, the US. Whenever there's not a problem in, the United, in, in Palestine, whenever there's not an intifada, whenever there's not a Jerusalem uh, uh, problem, Everybody is like, oh, it's chill. Everything is, is, everything is under control. There's no problem. I get this question asked me all the time. Oh, everything's cooled down in Palestine. What the hell are you talking about? It's been 70 years of occupation. It's been, this is, the small things need to expose the big things. And we need to start with them and stop thinking about the grand tier picture. Stop think, asking the big questions. Stop ask, small, start asking the small questions. Small questions. We are, we are everyday people here. We're not meant for the big, ma massive solutions of, to the to Palestinian. Yes. I'm just speaking as a Palestinian here. I just want to make sure there's not. I understand. Yes. What, what he said. <laughs> yeah. no. oh, thank you very much. Uh, BDS is obviously very, very important. Advocacy via the media and to uh, the Congress is obviously very, very important. But I think we need a little bit of realism here. The chances that the McCollum bill is going to pass, going to go anywhere, I think are very close to zero. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try to support it and so on, uh, but I don't think it's going to get more than 20 or 30 votes. I could be wrong. Maybe Ibrahim can tell me why I'm wrong. Uh, and. Uh, you uh, talked about bringing Israel to its knees, I think you said. Is that, uh, how would that be done? Uh, I don't, you know, BDS could be a factor. The U.S. strategic interests ultimately in the Middle East could be a factor. The fact that uh, uh, the president's uh, move on Jerusalem may be having some unintended consequences which could help the Palestinian cause, maybe factors. So specifically, how do you see that Israel would be brought to its knees and what chance do you think the McCollum bill has realistically? Well, you know, the question about being realistic is an interesting one. If we were in the mid-1980s, even the late 1980s, and somebody stood up and said, by 1994, Nelson Mandela is going to be president of South Africa. We, would have all, we all would have laughed. You know? So who knows what is realistic? All we can do is, like Ibrahim said, all we can do is do our best and put our, our, our best you know, effort. Now, 
If you ask me what I foresee, and again, looking back at South Africa, people, some people forget this. You know, South Africa was, was control, controlled all of Southern Africa. It's much bigger than Palestine. It had gold, uranium, and nuclear weapons. And again, it controlled all of Southern Africa, all the way up to Angola. It was a major force. And the U.S. had, you know, major interests in maintaining the apartheid regime, which is why the United States was one of the last to join the, uh, the call to boycott South Africa. So who knows what is realistic? All I know is that if we all put our efforts together, if we take BDS to its full potential, if we actually all act to get things like the McCollum bill, maybe not passed, but you know, every, call, every, every vote counts, then you know, we, we, we're one step closer. Now it goes beyond that because the, the, the Israeli lobby is very smart. They don't start with member of Congress. Every mayor, every member of every city council, every police chief of every city in America gets a trip to Israel. Now do the math. Every member, I used to live in a tiny city adjacent to San Diego. You know, 20,000 people, the city council members were volunteers. They did it because they liked their little community. They had no political ambitions, zero political ambitions. Every single one of them and the mayor who was also a part-time job. All of them got a trip to come to it. Why? That is, and the police chief. That is the kind of vested they make because even though today they might have no political ambitions, who knows, you know? Student leaders on campuses get the trip. They get to come here for APAC. We're talking about enormous amounts of money. So in, in a way, I agree with you that the work has to be done even before we get to Washington, D.C. Everybody in their own city has to find out who, if the police chief went, if he went, if he or she went, uh, you know, when they went, if they're about to go, members of the city council, and so on and so forth, so that it becomes local, because that's really where, the, you know, where, where things can change. That's all we got, as far as, I, as far as I can say, that's all we got. And that's why I said it's up to us. I mean, we either make it happen, if we all act, or the patient's going to die because, you know, it's too difficult. Okay. So last question before we... Uh... Okay. I'll be quick. Uh, well, your explanation is very good, and quite frankly, I agree with it. Uh, sometimes going concerns collapse suddenly, and there's total resistance, and... The closer that, that they get to the precipice, uh, the more belligerent and so on. So, so, so it could happen uh, yeah. in the state of Israel, and everything that you said about advocacy and all this sort of stuff is, is really very important. And there is a momentum, I believe, that's building. Uh, I don't know if uh, Ibrahim would like to say anything in addition on the McCollum bill. Right. We could, so we, we need to get some books uh, signed. So okay. We'll, yeah. Well, I'll talk to yeah, yeah. So we can all talk Together, after. Yeah, we're still, we can still come around. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Sir, Miko. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you all so much. Remember, please grab a book on your way out.